This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Today on the show, our guest is Herman Ponser. Herman is an associate professor of evolutionary anthropology at Duke University. He's a Leaky Foundation grantee who studies human evolution with a focus on how our bodies burn calories. He's the author of the book Burn. And this book and Herman's work blew my mind, and it made me think about human evolution, human bodies, and life in a totally different way. How are you doing? Good. Hi, Herman. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Let's get going. I'm ready to do this. To start with, can you explain what is metabolism? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's widely misunderstood. Uh, So metabolism is the umbrella term for all the work that our cells do throughout the day. And, you know, you got 37 trillion cells. Each one of them is a tiny little factory, bringing nutrients in, carving those up, making other uh, molecules, other proteins, sending those out into your body. So there's tons of work that each of those cells do. And that work requires energy. In your book, you say that understanding metabolism is the key to understanding all living things, including humans. Why is that? If you want to know anything about any organism, then it's hard to think of a better place to start than how many calories it's burning and how it's spending that energy because energy is the currency of life. And so everything we do, everything that shapes us, all the stuff behind the scenes, all of that is energy flow. I think, you know, when we ask the question, how did we become human? What are the traits that make us human? We walk around on two legs, that's different. We have big brains, big babies, lots of activity. They're all really expensive traits in terms of energy. Yeah, how do we make that work? It's actually a real puzzle to ask, how do we do it? Because, you know, you got you to pay the bills, right? If you're spending all these calories, you got to be able to bring them in. You have to have a body that can process them, right? You have to have a metabolic machinery and cells that are able to process that energy fast enough to go. So in other words, you have to have a, a metabolism that's ramped up, that's fast and able to handle it. When I was an undergraduate at Penn State, in the mid-90s, Wesley Aiello and Pete Wheeler published this paper called The Expensive Tissue Hypothesis, which is this idea that actually humans afford big brains by having small guts, right? You have these really rich diets, which means you can have a smaller gut, you can afford to have a bigger brain. So that's all about trade-offs. And in that world, you don't have to have a wholly different metabolism. You could just trade what you're spending those calories on. I remember as an undergraduate being totally blown away by that paper. And I think it set me on, you know, this path of where I've gone It's studying calories. But what's interesting is that is as important of an idea as that is, that's a landmark paper. But it's actually in some important ways incomplete because uh, Aiello and Wheeler based that assessment on almost no data, no measurements of energy expenditure. They didn't have the full energy budgets of humans or any of the other apes to compare to one another. And so, you know, if if they were right, if it's all about trade-offs, then that would mean that the total calories you burn every day is the same. But to actually test that idea, you need real measurements of energy expenditure. And I mean, and you did a lot of work comparing humans and other primates with all placental mammals, basically, and you found some really surprising things. Can you talk about that a little bit? About 12 years ago or so, 2008 or 2009, we started these sets of of projects, and they've been kind of ongoing since, to measure energy expenditures in all the non-human apes and as many non-human primates as we could. And it turns out metabolisms are completely different across species, and it's a really interesting aspect of evolution. And so there's this whole sort of story there, this whole world of metabolic evolution that we kind of hadn't really appreciated. First, if if you look at primates as a group, right? If you compare primates to other placental mammals, primates burn only 50% of the calories you'd expect for a mammal that size, okay? So for example, humans burn 2,500 calories a day or so. Men burn a bit more, uh, women burn a bit less. That's half of what a mammal our size should burn. Right. If you looked at an ungulate or a carnivore at our size, they'd be burning 5,000 kilocalories a day. Right. And that, that's not because they're super active or anything like that, just because that, their bodies are burning energy at a much faster rate. 
primates grow really slowly, right? We re reproduce really slowly compared to other mammals. We age slowly. And that pace of life seems to be sort of baked in to our metabolism. We run our engines slowly, and therefore life happens slowly for us. So in fact, you and I might hope to live into our 70s, 80s, 90s, is due to this big early evolutionary change that happened with primates to make us slow. That was the first big surprise we saw. But what if you compare us to the other apes? How do humans compare? If you compare humans to other apes, we're fast, right? So you zoom in on the little branch of the tree that's just humans and apes. And among those branches, humans are accelerated. We're burning 20% more energy every day than chimps and bonobos. And so there, that's the key that seems to be paying for our big brains, big babies. It doesn't stop there. So orangutans have slow metabolism, right? Orangutans are the sloths of the ape family tree. And that makes sense because they have these slow life histories. Uh, they grow slowly, they reproduce slowly. They live with these forests that have these food crashes where they're starving for part, you know. So metabolism is sort of this, again, it's those tectonic plates underneath everything. You don't notice them but it's shifting over evolutionary time and making what you think is normal as you know, making that possible. You know, we had a, a family dog that sadly, we, you know, died just really, really recently, actually. She was around for 16 years and that's a good run for a dog. And, you know, gosh, it's so sad to lose a family member like that. But, you know, 16 years, again, that's a good run for a dog. That's really short. My gosh. Right? I mean, if if when people die when they're 16 years old, it's a tragedy. Of course it's a tragedy. But actually, you know, we talk about animals living in dog years. But that suggests that they're the strange ones. And we're the strange ones, right? These slow life histories that we have, we're the ones who are weird. I'm sorry about your dog. It's interesting too that being human, we frame we frame them as the weird ones and try to try to make up this whole like dog yeah. ear type of thing to to make sense of it. Yeah. If you look at the pace of life of most other mammals and you ask, you know, for a, for a 70 kilogram species like humans, what would a typical life history be if we were like other animals? And the answer is you'd be fully grown by the age of two. You'd be a grandparent by the age of five. And life as you know, it would be completely uh, unrecognizable. Compared, you know, if, even if we were as big and as smart as whatever, you'd be dead before you're 20, you know, and that would just be how life goes. But it is not for us, is it? And it's interesting that as humans, we walk around just being so different and most people don't really think about it that much <laughs> well that's the beauty of the anthropology because it it just takes you outside of yourself and it makes you realize that actually none of this is normal <laughs> and we're you know we're all all every species is unique and interesting and we are too and should we be curious about that and try to understand why why we're so strange So when you when you learned about the differences in calorie use between primates and everything else, that must have led you down a path um, to trying to figure out how that happened. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The next question becomes, how do we pay for it? And how come other apes can't? Okay, so we have these bodies that are ready to burn more calories. In fact, they need to burn more calories. That's how we're built. And now you have, to, you have to get that food, you have to eat that food. And what is it about our human strategy that is, that's unique, that allows us to do this, uh, this high energy strategy, and somehow other apes aren't able to do it. And so this is work that I've been kicking around for the last few years. And it's, it's actually really fun. One possibility is that all of our technology and our big brains make us more efficient. And specific, let's be careful about how we say efficient. Efficient means I don't have to spend as many calories to get my calories, right? If I spend 100 calories to go out walking to get my food, I'll get more back than I would if I were a, a not as smart, not as, as technologically savvy ape. So it could be an efficiency thing where you're spending fewer calories 
to get your food. And that would make sense evolutionarily, right? Because in other words, you, you, you sort of have these benefits of big brains and this clever foraging strategy beginning to accrue without costing you anything. You wouldn't have to spend more energy to, to get there because, you know, you're getting more clever and, and, and the energy just comes in at a higher efficiency. And there's different ideas out there, but nobody had been able to really put this all together because nobody had the energy data to do it. So that's what we did. It took years and all this long-term data from the Hadza and Shimani. So when you do that work, what you find is that humans are incredibly inefficient, right? For all of our savvy, for all of our technology, for our big brains, we're actually really terrible <laughs> when it comes down to how many calories we spend to get food out of our environment. We are hugely inefficient, even though we have bows and arrows. We're talking about hunting together, hunter gatherers here. We have bows and arrows and axes and we're clever, right? We're smart. We're talking to them about where the food is. It doesn't matter. We're still really terrible in terms of efficiency at getting energy from our environment. But what we're amazing at is getting a high rate of return. So not only do the adults that are going out and foraging get all this energy, they're able to share the extra energy with kids and with moms who are pregnant or, or nursing and can't forage as well themselves, perhaps. And we just become awash in calories. And here's the part I love about this the most. The reason that it works isn't the hunting or the gathering, right? It's the and. It's the hunting and gathering. It's the and part of that that makes it work so well. Because they share, you manage the risk of the big game hunting against the sure thing of the plants and you get the benefits of both and it only works if you share so that's the key human strategy is sharing i love that but one thing i wonder is how do we know what came first is there a way to know if gathering and hunting and sharing came before or after we developed big brains. I think about the order of events here. You have to have the sharing first, right? And apes share a little bit. They're actually really terrible at it. My favorite uh, nugget of, of information on that is, is orangutan mothers share with their offspring when they're like the, the baby orangs are in the trees, like reaching for the berries, please mom, help me out. And the mom shares with them about 10% of the time. So imagine that in your own, I mean, that's like not mother of the year stuff, exactly, right? That's, it's kind of sad. Uh, <laughs> so they share a little bit, mostly, if at all, with their offspring. But you can imagine then that the sort of inklings of this are there already. You can imagine an early hominin or you know, an Australopithecus that was sharing about as much as apes share, but then behaviorally things shift, ecologically things shift, and, and sharing becomes a bigger part of their behavioral repertoire. And it, it all, you know, all of a sudden you have more energy available. And so, you know, natural selection is going to favor using those extra calories. It's never going to favor throwing them away or not burning them. But if they're there dependably, it's going to favor using them. So the behavior has to change to lead the physiology. That makes a lot of sense to me. So... Obviously, this is something that happens over millions of years, and extra calories don't automatically mean big brains, right? City pigeons and rats have access to more easy calories than ever before. But I'm guessing we're not seeing birds or rodents with bigger brains just because they can get pizza or big tubs of fat from behind restaurants, right? There's no guarantee that the extra calories go to big brains. It's something unique about our ecology that that was the favored place to, to put your extra calories. Most animals, when they get extra calories, are going to put them into reproduction. And we do that a bit. We have bigger babies more often, but it's not just that, is it? It's mostly these other things. So it's interesting. The question about how do you know when it happened? Well, hard to know. Of course, these are things, this is going to be speculative. We're talking about reconstructing behaviors that are happened billions of years ago. Uh, but the first time you've got cut marks on an animal that's too big to eat by yourself, it's probably sharing. And that happens around two, two and a half million years ago. And so I would put it there. I love that so much. So I could see why this is a fruitful and rich area to explore. 
um, human evolution through the lens of how we use resources to build ourselves and live our lives. So we, we've known, you know, for a long time that hunting and gathering is, is the lifestyle in which humans evolved. In fact, the genus Homo is basically a hunting and gathering genus, right? So over 2 million years of hunting and gathering. So if you want to understand how the human body works, that's, that's the ecological context that you want to study it. And there aren't many hunting and gathering communities left in the world. And the only one that's sort of, that I'm aware of that still has a large percentage of the population that's still hunting and gathering every day are the Hadza. So, you know, about again, 2008 and nine, um, I was interested in not just measuring ape expenditures, but also hunter-gatherer expenditures because nobody had done it before. So what did you go in thinking? The whole premise was that if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're really physically active, you're going to burn tons more calories every day than we do here in the U.S. and other industrialized countries. And so you would need to know, we need to know this energy expenditure because if we don't, we're missing that those extra calories. You don't really know how many extra calories, but it must be a bunch that you burn if you're a hunter-gatherer. And so, you know, you can kind of see where this is going. We go out, we spend all this money and time and energy and sweat. And uh, it was wonderful to work with the Hadza. So that was, that was a, a, a highlight. But we get back with our urine samples. We get them analyzed down at Baylor. And I get the data back. And I compare them to men and women in the U.S. and Europe. And it's the same. <laughs> it, it's the same energy expenditures. Even though Hadza men and women are about now five or 10 times more physically active every day than you and me. And they get more activity in a day than you and I probably get in a week. Doesn't matter. They are burning on average over the course of a week on average, uh, the same calories per day as you and I are. Mind blowing, totally shocked us. And that, that's been a whole new track of my research uh, after that discovery. What did you even make of that? It's, it's so surprising to me. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> mind blowing, you know, so, so thinking back to my undergraduate self in the 90s and when I was beginning to learn about energy expenditures, what I learned then, and I think this is still, you'll see this in textbooks still today, and people still talk about it this way, is that energy expenditures across species don't really change. So if I know your body size as a species, I know how many calories you burn per day. People do that all the time, these estimates. So I know how much this species or that species burns based on its body size. But then within a species, it's all about lifestyle. Right, these energy expenditures per day are really variable depending on what your lifestyle is. That's what I learned in the '90s. I think I've basically come to appreciate that it's, that's exactly wrong. <laughs> that actually, metabolic rates—how many calories you burn every day as an organism—that gets pushed around by evolution. So it's been pushed lower in orangutans, and it's been pushed higher in humans. And within a species, lifestyle has almost no effect on calories per day that your body adjusts so that if you are more physically active, your body spends less energy on other stuff. If you're less physically active, your body can spend more on those other tasks. What are those other tasks? Well, immune system, reproductive system, stress reactivity, all that stuff. Uh, and so, you know, it comes back to what is metabolism. Well, metabolism is all the work that our body does. And we're only really kind of aware of the movement part of that. Well, if you spend more energy on movement, you spend less on other, other stuff and you keep the budget basically where it was to begin with. You might have bigger and you know, more energy and less energy per, over day to day, but long-term running average, your body's trying to keep that in a pretty narrow range. And so that's how I have come to understand the Hadza data. I should say that we've seen this now in other populations too. We see this with the Schwar population in Ecuador. We've seen this with the Chimani in, uh, in Bolivia. I think we see this when we look at primates in the wild versus primates in the zoo. That comparison says the same thing. Lifestyle doesn't matter that much. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's been a huge surprise and um, really kind of fun to try to wrap your head around and understand. Yeah, definitely. So where are you going to take this from here? Yeah. Well, so I think there's a couple of, of interesting questions here. Um, and we're excited about a lot of them, but uh, first of all, you know, I'd like to understand exactly how the body adjusts. Can we have this observation that we've seen again and again and again across human studies, different contexts, in other animals, that you can change a lifestyle, you can make somebody or you can make a mouse in a lab, you can make it more active, and the energy per day doesn't seem to go up like in a corresponding way. So the body's adjusting. How is it adjusting? 
We think this has really big implications for understanding health. Probably part of the reason that exercise is so good for you is it gets your body spending calories with your muscles and not on things like inflammation and stress reactivity and sky high reproductive hormones, right? So this has health implications. It has implications for how we just understand our physiology in general. Uh, and so we want to really dig down and find out how these systems change and adapt. So we're doing work to figure that out. Um, we are also interested in if there are these constraints on how many calories you, your body can use every day, then there are a couple different points in life that that constraint is going to become really important. And the most obvious one is in pregnancy. So a mom who is in her third trimester of a pregnancy is burning energy at about as high a rate as she can manage, as far as we can tell, and still be able to absorb enough calories to not only pay for those that energy burn, but also to gain weight like you need to with a normal pregnancy, with a healthy pregnancy. And so that is a really stressful time, really pushing the metabolic machinery to its limits in pregnancy. And in a society like ours, where, where you know, you're not too physically active, well, maybe that's easier to manage. But if you're in a hunting and gathering society, where mom has to also be physically really active every day. Well, then that's a, another challenge. You looked at endurance sports to try to find the upper limits of human metabolism. Can you tell me about what you found? Yeah, well, you know, when we kind of came to that realization with that data set. So first of all, that's a really fun project that started with this guy, Bryce Carlson, and a group of what can only be described as delightfully crazy people who decided to run from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. on foot, a marathon a day, six days a week for five months. And he said, do you want to measure our energy expenditures when we do that? And I said, are you kidding me? Of course I do. That's, that's you know, you're never going to make it. <laughs> but let's go ahead and, and measure you while you try. And of course they made it. And it's an amazing uh, event. Um, and so we had their energy expenditures. And we wanted to know how that compares to other big events that have been looked at, like the Tour de France or, um, you know, the, the Western States 100, which is this 100-mile ultramarathon, or the Kona Ironman, um, or these Arctic trekking studies that have been done. And it turns out that if you plot the, the highest expenditures ever measured, the most you know, calories per day, you're talking like 15,000 calories to do a, an Ironman, for example, and, and then they, and it lasts half a day. Um, if you do the Tour de France, you're burning like six or 7,000 calories a day, and that lasts about 20 days, right? So you can begin to plot out how many calories a day you're burning, how long did you keep it up for? And that ends up plotting out, you kind of end up plotting out the very border, the very edge of human capability. You are mapping the limits of human physiology when you do that. Nobody has ever gone above that ability, above that expenditure for that long amount of time. And it ends up being a really clean, clear ceiling on what you can do. And at the nine month end of that, you know, duration versus expenditure graph, at the nine month point is pregnancy. There's no event that last nine months that anybody's ever been able to maintain a higher expenditure for than pregnancy, right? You can't do the Tour de France for nine months. We don't have to worry about it. So pregnancy is right up there with all these enormously taxing events. And when I mentioned this to my wife, Janice, uh, we have two kids. I said, oh, you know, I was working through some data today. And you know what's really cool? Pregnancy is like this massively difficult expenditure of uh, you know, the limits of human ability. It's like the Tour de France. It's like an ultra marathon. And she just looked at me and said, well, duh, tell me about it. <laughs> I think it's really interesting to think about pregnancy in that light because it's also an endurance event. And you could imagine then evolution pushing our metabolic machinery in different ways. It sort of just opens your mind about how all this physiology is connected. I think it talks to how energy is a sort of co cur common currency across all these tasks and a way to talk about them in the same breath. And so that's in my mind that it opens it all up. And, you know, that's one thing, like I said, we want to understand how your body manages those challenges in pregnancy, because I think it's a really interesting place to look next to, to get a, a better understanding of how we evolved. 
So when most people think about metabolism, they think about it in terms of exercise and weight management. But your work says that diet and exercise aren't paired the way we're told they are. Can you say more about that? My work says that diet and exercise are two different tools for two different jobs, right? Obesity is a problem of bringing too much energy in. That's your diet. So if you want to manage weight, it's all about diet and focus on the foods you're eating. If you want to stay healthy, right, which we all do, you need to exercise to do that because your, your exercise helps your heart, helps your, uh, you age well in terms of your cognition. It helps uh, all aspects of your, of your body are improved with regular exercise. So diet for weight, exercise for everything else. And, you know, that's the message. Um, so all I can say is I think we're just getting started. I think this is a, a pretty young area of research. The questions are old, but the, the research is new. Um, and I'm, I just look forward to sort of seeing how it develops in the years to come. Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherman. You bet. Thanks to Herman Ponser for sharing his work. You can learn more about the new science of metabolism in his book, Burn. You can also find this research paper and a link to his website in your show notes. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation today. Go to leakeyfoundation.org slash donate. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. This episode was produced by Ray Pang. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Origin Stories is made possible by support from the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, and you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>